I've got a couple more points I want to make about um, using variable payoffs. Uh, one thing that I need for you guys to be able to do, your homework this week asks you to be able to do this, is to um, be able to set games up in sort of a middle ground between the two ways we've done it. Okay, we first did the fundraising game where all the payoffs were expressed in specific numbers. Then on Tuesday we did it with all the payoffs expressed as variables. Um, and sometimes you will find yourself wanting to do both of those things. Sometimes you'll want to do a mix. Sometimes it will make sense to have some of the payoffs express the specific numbers, either because they sort of naturally fall out of the situation or um, because it's an exam and you're given some of the numbers. Uh, I guess those would be the two uh, sets of broad sets of reasons. So I wanted to do one example for you where some of the payoffs are numbers and some are left as variables and kind of give you a sense of the kind of questions we can ask with that kind of mixture. Okay, so it's um, same players, same stories as before. Incumbent and challenger, raise funds, not. Incumbent, raise funds, not. Now, what I want to do is, as we did on Tuesday, I'm going to let the value of winning office be represented by a variable. And I'm actually just going to use v. Okay? I am going to say that v is the value of being elected for both incumbent and challenger. Okay, so if I'm the incumbent and I get elected, I get V and you get zero. You're the challenger. If you get elected, you get V and I get zero. We're just sort of assuming that we've got the same value of office there. Um, we're going to assume that we have the same cost associated with fundraising. Okay. And what I'm going to do for this example is I'm going to put a number on v. I'm going to let v be 5, but I'm going to leave c a variable. Okay? So with that, that's actually enough to do payoffs. With those two assumptions about payoffs, same assumptions as we've had all along about outcomes so that the incumbent wins here, here, challenger wins there, incumbent wins there. What's the incumbent's payoff here? 5 minus C. Five minus C. Challenger's payoff? Oh. Challenger's payoff? Negative C. Negative C. Thank you. Good job, guys. OK, over here, incumbent's payoff? 5 minus C. Same as it's been. Challenger's payoff? Zero. Yeah. Uh, incumbent's payoff here? Zero. Zero. Challenger's? Five minus C. Incumbent's? Five. Five. Challenger's? Zero. I know. Sometimes when it gets so simple, you uh, can make a mistake uh, just by going too fast. OK. So these are the payoffs now. So we've got a game that has some variables and some payoffs. And just as we found on Tuesday in solving the game, we're going to find cases. Okay, so let's just start solving the game. Um, if we get to node 2 here, same numbers that I had before. I'll put my numbers back in just to be organized here. But node 2. The challenger is going to compare negative c to 0 and decide that 0 is better than a negative number, not raise funds. Strategic equivalent, the payoff associated with, uh, excuse me, the payoff associated with the optimal choice, right? 
Challenger's optimal choice is not to raise funds. Zero is better than negative C. From the incumbent's point of view, the strategic equivalent is five minus C or zero. Over here, we look at the challenger's choice. And here we have cases, right? Here, what the incumbent does depends on whether C is greater than or less than five. Okay, so there's two cases, and I'm just going to abbreviate a little bit here. I'm going to say case one, where five is greater than C. In that case, this number is greater than zero, so the strategic equivalent here is zero, five minus C. Okay? In this case, where five is greater than C, the challenger is going to raise funds here. Here's my strategic equivalent. Just as I do, did before, I'll switch colors. For the other case, case two here, where five is less than C. In this case, this is a negative number over here. The challenger would rather have zero than have a negative number. In this case, the strategic equivalent is five zero. Okay. So now we've got the two strategic equivalents. I'm writing this in a more compressed way than we wrote it on Tuesday, but I hope very much that you're seeing that it's the same logic here. That when we get to a node where the choice depends on parameter values, we divide that node into cases, and then we have to solve the remaining part of the tree, what's ever above the node where we divide into cases, we have to solve it separately for case one and case two. Okay. There's not much above it here, so that's not too demanding. Okay. Up here in case one, just reminding ourselves, it's five minus C. In this case, the strategic equivalent for the incumbent is five minus C over here, zero over here. Because we're in case one, okay, this is a little bit simpler than it was last time, we know that five is greater than C. Okay? So we know here that five minus C is a number that's greater than zero. So the incumbent raises funds. We're not done because we still have to take care of case two. Case two, five less than C. Now we're comparing five minus C to five. No matter what, as long as C is a positive number, we'd rather have five by itself than have five with something taken away from it. So in this case, the incumbents optimal choice at that first node is not to raise funds. Okay. So in this overall game, we have the rollback equilibria for case one when five is greater than C. Just reminding myself of what case one is, is incumbent raise funds, Challenger, not if incumbent raises funds, but raise funds if not. I'm not blocking anybody's way here. And the rollback equilibrium for the other set of cases for case two where five is less than C, is that the incumbent does not fundraise. The challenger does not fundraise if the incumbent does fundraise and does not if not either. Okay. What's the outcome in case two? Who wins? The incumbent. Okay. And in case one, case one corresponds to the case we started with, the incumbent 
also wins. Okay. Um, another point I want to amplify. Um, somebody asked this question last time about the case where 5 is exactly equal to c. Okay, and I said, well, there's not much we could do here. You are going to encounter this kind of case on your homework. What do I want you to say? Okay, well, an example of something that would be perfectly fine to say in this case would be when 5 equals c, we can't tell. Okay, we don't know. I don't want you to make up some complicated story about what they'll do when 5 equals c. When 5 equals c, the rollback process here is not giving us a single optimal choice. Okay? So for right now, this other knife edge case, we're just going to be um, satisfied at this point with saying that we can't tell. Okay? Later on in the class, We'll still not be able to tell what happens, although we'll go to a lot more work to realize that we can't tell. Right now, we'll just stick with the punchline. OK. So um, we got two cases here and three cases on Tuesday. Why? <coughs> Sorry? We gave V a number. OK, that is one thing we did. Um, so Y only two cases. There's actually another part of it. The, there are numbers we could give um, to the value of being elected that would still give three choices. Yes? That's where the rabbit goes in the hat. Right, Paul? Yep. Paul's um, point is that in this scenario, I kind of slid in an important assumption here. The important assumption was that the incumbent and the challenger have the same values for winning and fundraising. So what's missing from these cases here is the case where the challenger cared more about winning than fundraising, but the incumbent didn't. Okay, that was our, I think it was our case 1B um, in Tuesday's notes. Okay, so let's, um, rather than just cutting to the chase here, let me compare our cases here quickly with the uh, details on what we found on Tuesday. I'm belaboring this because my experience is that this is a place where, oh, Sunday night when you guys are working on your homework and you're not sure how many cases you should have and things like that, people tend to get insecure. So I'm hoping if you see me go through the logic, that helps you paddle a little bit more independently on your own. Okay. So with, okay, some jargon here, but Part of learning game theory is learning the jargon that goes around it. With uh, fully parameterized model, okay? The fully parameterized model had four parameters. Parameter, you'll recall, is just a synonym for variable. Anytime we represent a payoff as a variable, we're speaking of it as a parameter of the family of games. Okay, it's the thing that varies across the members of the, the family of games that we're representing with the tree. Okay, the fully parameterized model had four parameters, VI, VC, CI, and CC. And our cases were case 1A, where we had the challenger valuing office more than disliking fundraising, and same thing for the incumbent, the rollback equilibrium is, I'll do the most terse abbreviation here, raise funds. 
Not if the incumbent does. Yes, if the incumbent does not. Case 1B is the case where VC was greater than CC, but VI was less than CI. Here, our rollback is not, not raise funds. And finally, our case 2 was the case where VC is less than CC. And for case 2, it actually didn't matter whether the incumbent had a higher value of being in office or not. Okay? When you've got a challenger who doesn't care, then the rollback equilibrium is everybody does not raise funds all the time. The incumbent does not raise funds. The challenger's strategy is not not. Okay. So in this game, by saying that VI and v C are the same and CI and CC are the same, we didn't allow for this case. We didn't allow for this asymmetry. Okay, and we got rid of one of our, um, one of our possibilities here. And the interesting thing was we got rid of the only possibility that the challenger won okay, by making that assumption we kept the case where the incumbent wins and the incumbent raises funds. We kept the case where the incumbent wins, nobody raises funds. But we got rid of the case where the challenger wins. I think I was characterizing this as the burnt out incumbent on Tuesday. So what, where you might find yourself using this mix of numbers and variables would be in, I think you have some cases like this in your homework for this week, where I give you some numbers, okay, or I refer you to a scenario where I've given you specific payoff numbers, but then I ask you to let one part of the payoffs be a variable. And that's a nice way to frame the problem, because then you can ask questions like, how big does the cost of fundraising have to be uh, before we see it, dis before we see fundraising disappear? Okay, and well, the answer in this case would be five. When you see questions like, how does the outcome in the game depend on the value of being elected or the cost of fundraising, what that's asking you to do is to treat that part of the payoffs as a variable. Okay? So something you could say here is that what we expect to happen in terms of fundraising depends on how high the cost of fundraising is. Okay? If it's less than C, we expect the incumbent to do it. If it's greater than C, we expect the incumbent to not do it. Some things don't depend on that. In equilibrium here, we don't expect the challenger to raise funds at all, and we don't expect the challenger to ever win. Okay? So given a specific set of assumptions about payoffs, we can answer questions about how does the answer depend on some part of the payoffs. Whenever you're asked to analyze the effect of one part of the payoffs or one part of the structure, of the game, that's a tip that that part of the game needs to be treated as a variable. Okay? And you need to figure out what the cases are involving that variable. Okay? What the boundaries are, how many cases there are, and how different the cases are. Okay? And there's no hard and fast rules about how many cases you'll have, about when the Equilibrium strategies will be different for both players, which is how it worked out over here, or different for one player but not the other, which is how it worked out here. Whether you will have differences in every aspect of the, um, every aspect here of the situation, okay, 
or whether part, important parts of the situation won't depend on the cost of fundraising. Okay, you might think at first, oh, this is kind of a boring example because no matter what, the incumbent wins, but that's actually an interesting thing to know. Okay? If this assumption that all politicians are basically the same, they all have the same basic value for uh, being elected and the same basic dislike for fundraising, then it's interesting to know that however noxious fundraising it is, uh, fundraising is, it's not going to affect who wins the election here. Okay. All right. Um, one other thing, I, one other point I want to make about the game, I think I'm going to bring the full game tree back down here. And um, yeah, I'm always tempted to partly erase, but I think that's a wrong idea that I can just write the whole thing again faster than erasing my red and blue here. Okay. So in the fully parameterized game here, I won't ask you, but um, audit me on this. Make sure that I get the payoffs correct here. Bi minus ci, zero. This is zero. Vc minus cc. This is vi, zero. Look good? Those are our correct payoffs letting everything vary here, not having this sneaky assumption that the two politicians are the same. Okay, so now it's up there nice and clean and not colored on, and I'm going to color on it right away. Our three equilibria that we found for this family of games, again, I'm emphasizing that each particular version of the game that corresponds to a particular value for VI, VC, CC, and CI, each particular version has a single equilibrium, but each particular, the particular versions of the game fall into these cases that all have the same type of equilibrium, and there's more than one equilibrium for the family of games. And within the family, the equilibrium paths that we found were, this was one, this was our case 1A, right? This was our initial case that we started with. All I'm doing here is drawing the equilibrium path right now. I'm emphasizing not the full equilibrium, but in <coughs> equilibrium, in that case where both of them value office more than they dislike fundraising, this is what we expect to happen. In the case where, um, Oh, it's, I wonder where my blue pen went. That's a shame to have lost it so quickly. In the case where the challenger under the eraser. Under the eraser. Oh, bless your heart. I really did want it. Thank you. <laughs> Boy, not that I'm neurotic about my pens or anything, <laughs> but it was blue on Tuesday. I wanted it to be blue today. In the case where the incumbent was burned out. Okay, the incumbent didn't like fundraising, didn't think it was worth it to win office, but the challenger did, then our equilibrium path was this one. Okay. And then the third case where nobody liked fundraising, this elected office really isn't that great a job anyway, this was our equilibrium path. Okay. So we had this possibility and this possibility. Okay. I'm putting it back up here now to emphasize that three different terminal nodes are equilibrium outcomes for some parameter values. Okay, we can look at that from the other point of view too. And notice over here that this one never is. 
Okay, we were about as general as we could be with allowing the value of office to be anything, the cost of fundraising to be anything, allowing them to be different for the incumbent and challenger, and there was nothing we could do to make this outcome be an equilibrium path. Okay, that by itself is telling us something important. In particular, it's telling us something important about the narrative that would go along with this path, where there's vigorous competition on both sides by the incumbent and the challenger here. Um, that's kind of the high school civics portrait of elections, right? That everybody campaigns really hard and that there's a, a serious contest here. Well, no, not in this game. That does not happen. Okay. So one interpretation of that is to um, not to wonder why this doesn't happen. Again, what we've been doing all along is giving ourselves an answer for why we don't see this, why we don't see challengers raising funds and vigorously challenging incumbents. That's one way to, to put it. Does that sound like a bit of an overstatement, though? I hope it does. Okay. It's true. There are many races, especially for the House of Representatives and for state legislative offices in both chambers, where incumbents don't face very strong challenges. But it's, it's wrong. It's an overstatement to say it never happens. Okay? It does sometimes happen. In fact, sometimes the um, challenges are even so strong that they defeat the incumbent. Okay? So what I'm trying to do here is illustrate something I talked about on the very first day of class, like the role that game theory plays in social science. What I've done here, what I've been really belaboring over the past couple weeks, is I've spelled out a theory of incumbency advantage and the role of fundraising in a lot of detail. Okay. The detail was, I think, worth it because we got a very good understanding of the different things this theory predicts, what it predicts in different cases, and some things that this theory says never should occur. That by itself is very helpful. Okay? The fact that the theory says something should never occur, that does occur sometimes. It's not the typical thing, but it does occur sometimes. That is a springboard for progress. Okay? So far, we've got a logic that helps us understand part of what's going on in elections, and we've got an understanding of its limits. Okay? So if we want to go on and have a better theory, this is the accumulation of knowledge that's supposed to make social science better than what we had before social science, which is sort of everybody working by themselves on their own theory instead of building off each other. The reason why we can accumulate here is that we've got a very focused sense of where this theory doesn't appropriately apply. Okay? So what, what are some things we could put in the model? What are some things we could add to the theory that might actually get this to happen in equilibrium? Any thoughts on that? Assumptions we could change? So one change, Lillian's suggestion, is that <coughs> fundraising is not just yes or no, OK? That, that would help make this more realistic, OK? And there's aspects of fundraising that I think that change would help us with. I actually don't think it would get us out of the, the problem of predicting that challengers never raise funds here. Neve. Um, okay. Neve says the, the incumbent might have a bad reputation. Um, 
might be associated with a scandal, might be associated with a party that's got a problem. I'm going to put that in a broader category of different assumptions about outcomes. Okay. In fact, if I take off my game theory hat and put on my American politics hat, what I would criticize this game for is for going overboard on incumbency advantage. Okay? I think this might have been a little bit in Lillian's mind when she's thinking about fundraising being a continuous choice. Incumbency advantage matters. It is important, okay? but this idea that if an incumbent raises funds at all, he's going to win with probability one, that's over the top. Okay, so I'm going to say the incumbent might lose. And looking ahead to the thing we're going to be mainly doing next week, I'm going to really underscore the might. And I'm going to add maybe. It's one way to get this outcome to occur on the equilibrium path would be um, needs scenario where the incumbent is in such bad shape that you just know he's going to lose. Okay, that by itself would definitely uh, give the challenger an incentive to fundraise, but even the possibility that they might, if the probability of the incumbent losing is high enough, that by itself could turn the game around. And next week, the main thing we're going to do is add that aspect to our games. Okay. Any other thoughts on how to get how to get challengers sometimes raising funds. Yeah. An overzealous challenger, yes. Like, what would that mean? They want to raise funds, yeah. OK, so just as I put Neve's idea in a broader category, what's your name? I'm going to put Joel's in a broader category as well, which is a set of different assumptions about payoffs, now you might be saying, well, I'm being so general here. I've got it all parameterized. But remember those assumptions I had. Okay. One way to think about an overzealous fundraiser is, oh, all you guys think fundraising is a drag. I love fundraising. Bring it on. Let me do more. Okay. And if you have um, the costs turning into benefits, okay. So what would that would mean is we would have to allow C to be negative, so we'd be subtracting a negative number here. That would also be enough to do it. And I think that's not a fanciful example. The um, I'm a fundraiser bunny. Um, story that might be a little bit silly, but more likely is a scenario that I think we talked about last week. A challenger that's looking beyond just this election. Okay, maybe I'll lose this time. It's not just about this election. I'm going to demonstrate my ability as a candidate. I'm going to demonstrate what kind of a good politician. I'm a uniter, not a divider. And next time along, when there's an open seat, perhaps the party will stand behind me. I think that's a, actually a very important part of this scenario in reality. OK. So this little exercise, what we've been doing here, this really is what social scientists use game theory for. Okay, You start with a set of assumptions that more or less make sense, that seem to describe a case that, if it's not ubiquitous, is pretty widespread. You put those assumptions into the game and figure out exactly what that means. And it often will give more predictions than you think. Okay? But it often will also say that something shouldn't happen. When you get to this kind of situation where something never happens, in the game, but does happen 
in reality. In the philosophy of science, um, people call that an anomaly, okay? something that your theory can't explain. And anomalies, if you're taking the short view and you're a researcher trying to get an article published or something like that, you might think the anomaly is really a pain. You don't really want it to happen. But in the big view, anomalies are what we learn from. Okay? Anomalies are what tell us what's wrong with our theory, what's left out of our model, what about our initial assumptions that sounded so good when we were assuming them might be inadequate. Okay? So the response to anomalies is to um, expand and or change your assumptions. And for most of this class, what we're going to be doing is thinking about ways to change assumptions about outcomes, about payoffs, about the nature of interaction. We're not going in this class to learn how to do the, um, the how to implement the idea Lillian raised of looking at choices that have a large number of values. We call this a continuous choice. Okay? Um, if you're interested in it, there are sections in the book that you can read about. This is a part of game theory that's not all that hard. Um, it is something you need calculus for. Okay? Most of you guys, I think, probably did take calculus. And if you took it, you probably remember that a big part of a calculus class is finding an optimal value, right? Finding the value of x that makes y the highest or the lowest. These kind of continuous choices are that kind of calculus problem. Okay? We're not going to do it in this class. It's not that hard. If you're interested in game theory and haven't taken a calculus class, that's something you should do because then you can uh, approach this set of interesting problems. All right, so a little bit of cleanup here. I don't think I need to erase my tree. And I want to, still looking at this game, actually, I think I am going to clean up the colors. Back to The payoffs that we were initially motivated by, or I guess maybe the payoffs that I uh, started with at the beginning of the game, uh, where this is, uh, I mean, I'm going to use the numbers again. The 10 for winning office and not fundraising, 8 for winning office and fundraising, 3 for not fundraising, um, and not winning, one for fundraising and winning. This, just from week one, let's put those payoffs back in. So we had eight, one here, eight, three here, three, eight, and ten, three. Those payoffs look right to you guys? Okay. Three cases of somebody winning office and fundraising, so they get the second highest outcome. Two cases of people not winning office but not raising, or three cases like that where people, two challengers and one incumbent, lose the election but don't raise funds. One really horrible case for the challenger of losing the election and raising funds. One really terrific case for the incumbent of um, winning the election and not having to do any work. With those numbers, those numbers put us in the red equilibrium case right here. And they gave us these payoffs. And I think it was a week ago today, um, we kind of as a side point observed that this seemed like sort of a mediocre uh, set of payoffs in the sense of comparing it 
with this one. Actually, I think we first made the observation in the context of that left, middle, right game we were playing. Okay. What is annoying about the rollback equilibrium in this form of the game is the outcome is inferior in the sense that we could see a better world here. We could see a world that's no worse for the challenger. Okay, the challenger is no worse off. She's getting a payoff of three in both cases, and the incumbent's better off. Okay? So nobody's worse off in this scenario. Somebody's better off, and we're not there. Okay? When we observe that kind of thing, it should bother us. Okay? So the sense in which this outcome is inferior is because the incumbent could be better off, could have a higher payoff without the challenger being worse off. Okay. So what we're doing now is we're segueing to evaluating the outcome of this game. And what I'm saying is I'm evaluating that outcome and I'm saying it's not very good for this specific reason. Okay. This kind of thought experiment, this way of evaluating What's going on by just asking the question, could we make things better for some of the people in our group without hurting anybody? Okay, that's a pretty, it seems like a pretty innocuous idea to do that. When we're using that kind of thought experiment, we're using ideas associated with uh, um, 19th century social scientist, I guess sociology is kind of claimed uh, Pareto as one of the founders of their discipline, but his ideas um, are very influential in economics and political science as well because this kind of experiment, this kind of thought experiment here is a Pareto comparison. When I'm saying that the incumbent could be better off without the challenger being worse off, other ways to say exactly that is that this equilibrium outcome is, I'll do it in negative, not Pareto efficient. Okay. Other ways to say the same thing, I'll write them over here. Um, the equilibrium outcome is Pareto dominated, okay, or there is a possible Pareto improvement. Okay, so the whole set of terms that all involve the same idea of asking, can I improve things for at least one person and not make things worse for anybody? Okay, if that's true, if that's true, then the situation you're starting in, the situation where you could make things better for somebody else without making them worse, for all the other players, that situation is bad. Okay? You're in a situation where you could help somebody without hurting anybody else, and you haven't done it. Okay? That's what makes it bad. One of the things that is um, I think maybe a little bit confusing about the idea of Pareto efficiency is that it's, when you first hear it, 
you can get the good and bad easily mixed up. You could say, hear me say, look, we can make one person better off without making somebody else worse off. And it sort of sounds like, look at all these opportunities we have. Isn't that a good thing? Okay, That's not quite right. It means, look at all these opportunities we have, and we haven't done it yet. That's the bad thing. Okay, So um, here's an illustration of it. This is uh, an illustration that is unfortunately part of my life. It might be part of yours, too. This is an illustration from driving in LA. Okay, So it happens to me when I take one of my shortcuts, none of which are very short, but one of my shortcuts going from UCLA to where I live in South Santa Monica is I go west on sunset and eventually turn south. Okay? And at the end of the day, that's not too bad. The westbound traffic on sunset is not terrible. The eastbound is really bad. Okay? All those people who work in Santa Monica and live all over the place are, are going that way. So here's me. I'm driving west. You guys are all eastbound cars, and you're stuck. You're not going anywhere. Okay? At some point, I'm going to need to go south. Okay, I'm going to need to make my left turn. And one thing that can happen is Lillian, sorry, I'm going to pick on you here. I'm going to make Lillian the bad guy, even though she's not a bad guy at all. Lillian here is right here blocking Bundy. That's where I want to turn south. Okay. Now, if Lillian would just let me in, she's not going to be any worse off. What's your name? Darren. Darren is right here. Darren is blocking her way. She's not going any farther, and Darren's way is blocked and all of this. Okay? So if she lets me turn, she's no worse off. I'm way better off. I've made my turn. I'm heading south. I'm picking up my kids. It's all good. Okay? So if she lets me drive through here, then we're in the world of Pareto and efficiency. Then all you guys are still stuck, and it's too bad. We'd like to make you better off, but there is no way to do that. But that Pareto improvement has been made. What's bad about this, the situation where I could be made better off without hurting any of these guys, what's bad about that is the could part. They're not letting me turn. They're just right there on each other's bumper. Okay? So that's a Pareto inefficient situation. It's when somebody could be made better off, and we're not doing the thing that would make them better off, even though it doesn't hurt anybody else. Okay? We like these Pareto criteria in the world of game theory or any of the <coughs> kinds of political economic analysis where we're representing pay payoffs with numbers because, as I said a couple of times, we don't want to think we know more than we do with these numbers. And in particular, we don't like comparing one person's utility to another, OK? Because we really don't know. Um, if something hurts one person and helps another, it's very hard often to measure whether the increase in utility one person has is truly offset by another's decrease in utility. Um, this is a problem we have in my household where both parents um, actually have PhDs in economics, so we talk in these terms a lot, but as far as I could tell, my husband's Utility is very, very sensitive. Every issue matters a lot to him. And actually, in economics, there's a word for somebody like that, a utility monster. Okay? He can't lose on anything. Okay? And I'm just not like that. There's actually a lot of things I'm indifferent between. My utility is not measured in the same very, very fine units that um, my husband <laughs> is. And, um, OK, so in one sense, if you're really going to be utilitarian, yeah, the world would be a better place if he won on every issue. But guess what? I don't really like that. OK? So I don't like those kind of interpersonal comparisons. And uh, we're getting some laughter here. Maybe other people have found themselves in similar uh, uh, situations sometimes. Um, so we try to stay away from those situations where we are trying to do these comparisons of utility where not only do you really not know whether my husband is that much more sensitive to me, you also don't know whether he's even telling the truth or not. There's always that suspicion of, oh, come on, do you really care that much about raisins in the oatmeal? Um, <laughs> so if we want to avoid interpersonal comparisons, 
the Pareto criterion lets us do that. It's not saying anything about how much anybody's helped. Okay, it's just looking for cases where somebody could be made better off. A little better off, a lot better off, doesn't matter for the Pareto criterion without hurting anybody else. Okay, so again, since nobody else's utility is changing, we don't have to worry about that. So the problem here, the general version of what might be disturbing about this outcome here is that it is this outcome, Pareto inefficient. Okay. Here we are in the situation of the incumbent winning and fundraising. The incumbent would be better off and the challenger would not be worse off if fundraising was banned. Okay, the election would come out the same, nobody would have to raise funds, wouldn't that be good? Okay, so from the incumbent and the challenger's point of view, this Pareto inefficient outcome should be annoying. Okay. One of the main uses of game theory is to identify situations that are going to systematically give Pareto inefficient outcomes so that we could think about ways out, ways to do something that would improve things for one or some of the people in the interaction without hurting anybody. Kiara? Would the fundraising for the 10-3 node make it worse for the incumbent because then you have to do raise funds and So Kiara's question is, if we move from the 10-3 node to the 8-3 node, that would be worse. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to expand on that question um, by writing a few more things out here. And what I think I'm going to do is let's put letters on these terminal nodes. Okay, so we've got node A, node B, node C, and node D. Okay. It's going to be easier to talk about them than if we're uh, talking about the payoffs or even the paths. Elaine. I mean, I know that's an annoying situation, but even if the incumbent did choose not to raise funds, then at that point the challenger would choose to raise funds and they would end up with a lower outcome. So it's not possible to get there anyway. That, it's not possible in the sense of, so, so let me just, for the mic thing, let me repeat Elaine's observation, which is very good, that in one sense, 10-3 outcome D is possible. It's better. It's something that could happen. What Elaine is saying is if you think about people being strategic, it's not really possible. Okay? Usually in Pareto analysis, we take behavior out of it. Okay? So when we're evaluating whether an outcome is Pareto efficient or inefficient, we don't just think about what is possible along the equilibrium path, or even as part of an equilibrium strategy, we really think about all the possible outcomes in the game. That's an important point. You guys on your homeworks are going to be asked to decide whether things are Pareto inefficient or not, and I'm going to go belabor that point in a minute. And when you're asking that, you want to be sure to compare the outcome you're interested in, it's usually the equilibrium outcome, to all the other things that could happen, even if those things aren't the optimal choices people. Okay. Another way to, to approach that thing is, yes, if they're all being strategic and rational, we'll never get to this Pareto dominating outcome. And should we think, well, maybe they shouldn't be so strategic. They'd be better off if they weren't so strategic. That would be the, another way to think about why we're including this outcome, even though we think we'd never go here. Actually, with these payoffs, we don't think we'd ever be at any of the other nodes. Okay, so just kind of wrapping our brains around the lingo here and asking first, is outcome B Pareto efficient? Actually, I've said here it's not Pareto efficient. 
I, and by implication, I think I've said what it means to be Pareto efficient, but I've mostly talked about what it means to not be Pareto efficient. So over here, let me write down the difference, the definition for Pareto efficiency. Okay. The outcome is Pareto efficient if there is no other outcome in the game for which one player's payoff is higher and no other players payoff is lower. The reason why I first define Pareto efficiency in terms of the negative is, is it's actually easier to show that something is, is not Pareto efficient than to show that it is. Okay. To show that it's not Pareto efficient, all I had to do was find one other outcome somewhere in the game. Okay. It just had to be in the game. It didn't have to be along any kind of equilibrium path. Some other outcome where one player's payoff was higher and the other player's payoff was no worse. Okay. In order to find out whether an outcome is Pareto efficient, we have to do all those possible comparisons and conclude that no, there's no other outcome that that would be true for. Okay. That is why, that's why we need such a big vocabulary for our Pareto words. Pareto efficiency is kind of the main thing. We want to get to that, but because Understanding whether something's Pareto efficient or not can involve making a lot of complicated comparisons. We have a couple of other phrases that help us keep the steps organized. Okay, so here's our Pareto efficiency definition. A shorter definition here is outcome x. Pareto dominates outcome y if at least one player's payoff in x is higher than in y and no player's payoff is lower in x than in y. Okay. So in order to say that we're at a place that's Pareto efficient, in order to say that we're at a pretty good place, x here, we have to compare that outcome to all the other ones and see if any of them Pareto dominates it. If we get to the end, we've tried to see if any of them are Pareto dominating and none of them are, then we could say, OK, yes, it truly is Pareto efficient. Okay. Adding a couple of other forms of the phrase here. So if you, actually let, let me add something down here. The synonym for Pareto dominates is that x is a Pareto improvement over. Okay, so x is a Pareto improvement over y. 
Okay, so two phrases. X Pareto dominates Y, or X is a Pareto improvement over Y. These are phrases that allow us to compare two specific alternatives. Pareto dominates and Pareto improvement. Okay, and just again, let me emphasize here. These ideas allow us to compare one outcome with another, right? Pareto efficient and the other thing that you'll hear that really is synonymous, Pareto optimal, these allow us to evaluate one outcome. Okay. So the way we evaluate one outcome, we pick the one that we're interested in, and when we use the Pareto dominance, Pareto improvement idea to compare it to the other outcomes. Okay. So evaluating one outcome, comparing two outcomes, going back to these definitions, we've got the Pareto improvement, Pareto dominating relationship here. As you look at the payoffs associated with each outcome to see if one of them is higher for one player and not lower for the others. Once you've done that, putting the Pareto dominant, Pareto improvement idea into this definition, we can kind of compress this. An outcome is Pareto efficient if, so just another way to restate this, there is no possible Pareto improvement. Okay, it would be one way to restate this whole definition. Restatement one. Another way to say exactly the same thing is there is no outcome that Pareto dominates. It. Okay. okay. So the way I got into this business of writing out all the definitions and kind of the, the close synonyms that you'll hear was in response to Chiara's question about, okay, so what are we saying when we're, what are we asking when we're asking whether outcome B here is Pareto efficient? When I'm saying it's not, the sort of the why of my answer is no, because D is a Pareto improvement, okay? Or because D Pareto dominates it, okay? How do I know it's a Pareto? improvement? What level of explanation would I like to see you guys use if I was asking you about Pareto efficiency? I would like, to see, like you to say what the Pareto improvement is. So let's say that. Okay. In D, incumbent has a higher payoff and challenger has same payoff. Okay. <coughs> now what I think Kiara might have been wondering about, I'm not sure, is have we said anything about whether outcome D is Pareto efficient or not? That was what you were wondering, right? And the answer is we have not. Okay, and that's one of the slippery things. Okay? We've said that it's an imp a Pareto improvement over B, and that's not enough for us to say that D is Pareto 
efficient. Okay, it's actually going to turn out that it is. Okay, and that was your insight too, that there wasn't any way to do better for one player and not worse for another here. But to do that part of the logic, we have to start with D and compare it to all others. So the last thing we'll do for class today is that precise question. So it's a different question. When we ask about one outcome being Pareto efficient, we're not necessarily getting, we won't get the full answer to whether the other ones are. So is D Pareto efficient? Okay. Well, if it's Pareto efficient, what I have to be able to show you is that there's no Pareto improvement. So I have to look for all the possible places there could be a Pareto improvement and show you that there's not one. Okay. Well, there's three places I have to look. Okay. Point one, does A Pareto dominate D? Does it? Certainly not. A is a terrible outcome. A is worse for both players. Okay? No. A is worse for both. Does B Pareto dominate D? Well, no. We just found that out above that the incumbent is worse in B. Okay, so no, incumbent is worse off in outcome B. Last outcome here. Does C Pareto dominate D? Does C Pareto dominate D? No. <laughs> C is an interesting outcome. C is one where the challenger has a higher payoff in C and the incumbent has a lower payoff. Okay? But when one player has a higher payoff and the other one has a lower payoff, neither can Pareto dominate the other. Okay? It means that there is a zero-sum conflict there. Okay? So no um, incumbent is worse off. Only after I've done this, and if it was a bigger tree with more nodes, I would have had to do it for every terminal node. Once I've gone through all the other nodes in the game and said, no, this is not a Pareto improvement, this is not a Pareto improvement, this is not either, now, after doing this whole thing, I can conclude, yes, this was kind of the intuition that Kiara had, this is the logic that we need to say, yes, D is... Pareto efficient. Okay. So the thing I want to leave you with is to juxtapose, this was kind of a lengthy set of comparisons to come to the conclusion that something was Pareto efficient. To conclude that something was Pareto inefficient, all I had to do was find one comparison where one other outcome, Pareto dominated that. Okay. So we'll pick up the concept of Pareto efficiency in the context of a new game next week.